in the king's chamber, blinded and attended by the sun and the moon, I received my first death and my second birth. I was crucified upon the cross of the solstices and the equinoxes and buried in the great coffer. A death-like cold cut to the marrow of my bone and a tone unknown to any musical scale rang out. While my body lay in the coffer, I soared as a human-headed hawk through the celestial realms, ascending through the seven rings, returning to each of the seven governors their lower powers, shedding passions, ambitions, machinations, and illusions. Finally, naked and unburdened of all the accumulations of the seven rings, I soared to the eighth sphere, to the realm of the fixed stars, and I knew firsthand the eternity of life, light, and truth, as well as the illusions of sickness, darkness, and death. Eons ago, a burst of primordial emerald light illuminated the darkness of ignorance, the beams shining outwards from the heavens unto the earth, and to those whose inner eye was open was revealed the pristine and divine truth of the universe. All who beheld this light knew it was of perennial and monumental significance. It penetrated all matter and form and only those made of true being appeared solid before it, casting shade upon the ground. In the protection of that shade, ancient cities were built, their temples spiraling upwards towards the light, so that those who climbed the towers could escape the shadows and bathe in the green rays of the primordial essence. In time, the light would fade into a pale yellow, and all manner of things would appear solid again. These great lords of being would first become scarce, and later would totally disappear from the earth. Only memories would remain of their magnificence, and their imminent reign would become the stuff of legend. Those with the vague memory of the lords of being would do their best to capture their energy and greatness, creating powerful mantras that encoded their Olympian qualities into initiatic rituals. But just as the masters faded from this world, eventually so did all memory of them, and finally there were no more initiates remaining. Lost were the teachings of the time when the heavens were filled with the green light, and the world was plunged into an all-encompassing darkness. Evola opens this chapter by explaining that initiation represents a degeneration from tradition. This may seem surprising given his strong emphasis on the necessity of the initiatic path within the world of tradition. However, he explains that this is because there is a shift from the regal function being innately embodied in a being who is naturally above human limitations, versus a being who is not born this way but who must somehow acquire the regal function and undergo an inner ontological change. In the first case, the being who innately embodies the regal function is something divine, a god or a demigod. This is the Olympian nature of which Evola often speaks. 
In the second case, the being who must acquire this regal dignity typically fits the profile of the hero. The hero must undergo a quest or challenge of some sort, which changes him on a fundamental spiritual level, elevates him to the Olympian plane, and endows him with a new regal nature as a result of his contact with the transcendent. It must be stressed that the initiatic hero is not the same as the Nietzschean Superman who belongs to the Promethean plane, still just a man, but trying to illegitimately acquire the superior dignity and power of the gods. The Superman is the extreme and problematic strengthening of the species of man, whereas the initiate no longer belongs to this species at all, having legitimately acquired an innate divine dignity and earned his seat on the Olympian plane through conquest of the divine light, which is the unique essence of all spirituality. There are two ways in which this acquisition of divine dignity can occur. The first is through initiation, which is autonomous and direct, and the second is through consecration, which is a mediated investiture. If initiation is considered a degeneration from tradition because one must acquire regality instead of being born with it as an innate quality, consecration represents a further degeneration still, where one is no longer capable of acquiring it for himself, but must have it bestowed upon him by a priest who mediates the supernatural forces on his behalf. Because the concept of initiation is so foundational to the world of tradition and to Evola's writings, it is important that we fully grasp what is meant by it in the purest sense, as authentic initiation is so distant from the present time. Distant not only from the dominant modern mentality born of the movements of Romanticism and the Enlightenment, but also distant from religion in the way that it is usually conceived of in the West, and also a far cry from the ritualistic residues of various occultist sects. Initiation represents the highest ideals of mankind, and was an integral and essential part of all great traditions and civilizations. Our understanding of the world of tradition would be incomplete if initiation were excluded, glossed over, or misunderstood. In its most basic meaning, to initiate means to establish a new beginning. We have spoken previously of initiation being a second birth, and those who were initiated were called dvija, twice born. From an ontological perspective, initiation is indeed a type of rebirth, and the mythologies of the world are replete with stories of gods and heroes who must die and be reborn to become what they were meant to be. It is from this on which the basis of ritual is established, where the idea behind the rite is to tread the path of the past glory of the gods, so that if the initiate has those latent seeds of something divine within him, the rite will cause those seeds to sprout and become the re-emergence of a certain regal essence. It is important to clarify that the dignity acquired by the initiate was not related to any human virtue or merit. All of the human virtues combined will not produce an initiatic quality. Initiation sparks an ontological shift of being to evoke divinity in man. It does not produce a set of behavioral traits, although such traits may be downstream from the change in his essential nature. Instead, it is something more sublime that we can't quite put our finger on because it is not of this world. This makes it rather difficult to qualify what this essential dignity actually is, because it is challenging to describe it without resorting to a list of virtues and merits. As with all metaphysical concepts, the more accurately one tries to pin the idea down with our limited language, the further away one gets from the true meaning. Evola writes in The Bow in the Club that the fundamental premise of initiation is that the human condition, along with the limits which define the common individuality, can be surpassed. It is a change of state, a passage from one way of being to another 
in the most objective sense, and he notes that it is sometimes described as a physical event to stress its real and ontological character. The premise of initiation is based on the theory that there are multiple states of being, of which human is just one of many, and that there are states of being that are both inferior and superior to the human state. Also in The Bow in the Club, Evola expounds upon the difference between high initiation, which is the category of regal initiation that he is primarily focused on, and the tribal initiations of primitive peoples. He remarks that the personality has two options for opening, one upward and one downward. The upward opening is the path of high initiation, which is Uranian or Olympian in quality and stands under the sign of transcendence or supra-life. Rebirth into being is the aim of this high initiation and upward opening. The lower opening is that of the tribal initiations, such as coming-of-age initiations. In this case, the initiate is not opening himself up to a transcendent connection with the divine, but to the mystical vital force of his stock, his people's totem, which he integrates into himself and makes it his own, the aim being to establish contact with particular forces of nature rather than contact with the divine. The change in his ontological nature always has the character of something collective, naturalistic, and subpersonal, rather than something suprapersonal and transcendent, as is the case in high initiation. The concept of high initiation acquires the fullness of its higher significance by going beyond nature, beyond mere material life. He also remarks that these lesser primitive initiations take on an ecstatic character, and that ecstasy is a going outwards, which he contrasts to the ecstasy of high initiation, described as a going inwards to reconverge with the center. Initiation is the process of the center uniting with the center, and the one uniting with the one. It is the seeking of God within oneself, for those who seek God outside themselves never find Him. This is fundamental to understanding the nature of initiation and of initiatic knowledge. Experiential wisdom takes priority over rational cognition. In this context, to know does not mean to think or to have learned something, but to have experienced something, to have fully realized it and identified with it. When you have become one with the transcendent experience, when you can stop analyzing it and just be in it, then you obtain true knowledge. It is said that one did not seek to take initiation in the ancient mysteries in order to learn, but rather to achieve a sacred state through a deep and active experience of it. Initiation is thus a solitary, sacred, and inner experience. Evola wrote in the Doctrine of the Synthesis of Race that there is a possibility of regaining, through heroic action, the golden, solar, primordial state. Initiation is required because of that degenerative shift away from the primordial state. It represents the pathway back to that primordial state of being. Retracing the steps of the gods through ritual action brings us back to the divine state so that we may once again partake in the awareness of our own divinity and have experiential knowledge. This knowledge in the initiatic domain is justice. Justice in the esoteric rather than the secular sense. Justice meaning the principle that one should fulfill the function typical of their own nature. Justice as hierarchy with everything in its correct and natural place. This is one reason why initiation is so closely related to kingship. The regal condition must embody this cosmic justice, and so the king must be initiated at the highest level because one cannot embody justice, dharma, without having authentic higher knowledge.
In Evola's anthology, Introduction to Magic, Abraxas writes, Look, this shore is the one plagued by misery, darkness, and pollution. Before you is the mighty current. There lies the other shore. On this side are ignorant people, lacking in knowledge, pale, passive, intoxicated, whose lives are still outside, and on this side of the waters. On the other shore you will find virile men, heroic souls, awakened to disgust, to revolt, to the great awakening. Having left one shore behind, they dare face the current and the undertow, being led by their ever more firm, unshakable will. Once there, they are known as survivors of the waters, walkers on the waters, the holy race of the free, the conquerors, the lords of life and salvation, the radiant ones. They are the dragon slayers, the dominators of the bull, consecrated to the sun, and those who have been transformed through Ammon's power and wisdom. In his book, The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times, René Guénon remarks on the initiatic symbolism of a navigation across the ocean, representing the psychic domain which must be crossed while avoiding all dangers in order to reach the goal. This is not unlike the metaphorical crossing of a body of water in the afterlife, in which the deceased soul makes the Olympian leap into the heavenly realms, instead of being dragged down into the current. Avila himself remarks in a footnote to this chapter that this crossing or navigating of the waters is one of the most recurrent initiatic themes. In the Eleusinian Mysteries, the initiate must cross the stream of generation by means of his own strength, that is, he must swim. He leaves behind on the banks his body, soul, and mundane personality. He later crosses this river again, this time by boat, wearing animal skins, signifying his newly acquired dominion over the totemic forces. When one can undertake this symbolic crossing, he becomes qualified to be a leader. Further references to the crossing of the waters is found also in the Norse saga of the hero Siegfried, who claims to be accomplished in the true ways of the sea, and he knows the way to the mysterious island of the divine woman Brunhilde, representing his mastery over the feminine principle. Another appearance of this theme is the belief that one must cross the river Thund in order to arrive in Valhalla. From the British Isles, we find the initiatic tale of the bard Taliesin, set adrift for three days and nights in a coracle, and of Merlin and his initiates navigating the ocean in a boat of glass. There are some accounts of actual druidic initiates literally undergoing such a trial as being set adrift at sea in the middle of the night, left to the mercy of the waves and rocks, and if the initiate survived this, his initiation was complete, and he became one with the great solar patriarch, having, like the sun, undertaken the nocturnal voyage of the dead, traversing the infernal lake of the underworld and landing on a blessed island. In the Vedas, King Yama was referred to as the son of the sun and the first to find the way to the other world. He was referred to as one who has gone far out to sea. Yama was not the only one to be known as the son of the sun. The Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten also styled himself as the son of the sun and took over the title of Orma, meaning one of great visions, which is to say, an initiate. Naturally, regal initiation is intended to produce solar qualities in the one who undergoes it, so it is perhaps fitting that an initiated king should take such a title. In the Chaldean mythos of Mesopotamia, the hero Gilgamesh is said to walk the sun's path and the mountain path, and must cross an ocean in order to reach a sacred garden in which he will find the gift of immortality. This journey was facilitated by the sun god, whose daily journey across the sky symbolized the pathway to eternal life. 
Evola also points out the recurrence of the symbols of islands and mountains. Once the initiate has crossed the waters and reached the dry land, typically he must climb to the top of a mountain or some sort of height, often representing the overcoming of the planetary influences, of shedding cravings, aversions, and vices, and ascending through each of the seven spheres to the pure state of being represented by the realm of the fixed stars. One historical example of this is the Tower of Babel, ostensibly built for astronomical purposes, but almost certainly used for initiations. It was a spiraling ziggurat, which we already know to be an axial symbol linking the heavens to the earth, and which was described on terracotta tablets as the Tower of the Seven Spheres, and each stage of ascendance on the tower was consecrated to each of the seven traditional planets. Some Mithraic initiations also took on astrological illusions. We can find a representation of the initiate in the tarot card of the hermit. An aged man stands atop a misty mountain. He walks his path alone, in solitude and suffering. Solitude because initiation is profoundly internal and individual, and suffering because nothing worth having comes freely or easily. He wears the cloak of Apollonius, a mantle of fine wool, to wrap himself in that he may hear the small voice, representing full and complete self-possession, shielding himself from blind tendencies, and thus rendering himself metaphorically invisible. He carries with him the lamp of Hermes Trismegistus, shining with a higher inner knowledge which cuts through past, present, and future, and illuminates the shadows of nescience with the light of truth. The light takes the form of the six-pointed star of Solomon, representing wisdom, and the hermit bows his head in service to it. He carries the staff of the patriarchs, an axial symbol that readers of the earlier chapters may recall is representative of the bridge between heaven and earth, and a symbol of the regal unmoved mover. The hermit's residence upon the mountain is a symbol of his ascent from the profane world into the sacred. Such is the journey of the initiate. The initiate finds further representation in the zodiacal sign of Capricorn, the sea goat. Half fish and half goat, it is one of the most curious signs of the zodiac. What can we learn of initiation from this mythical creature? Our sea goat must pull himself from the primordial waters, leaving behind his lower half, to ascend the mountain. Along the way, he finds flowers of attained desires, each with its own thorn of disillusionment. It is not what he is truly seeking. And onward he climbs, clinging to the rocky ledges, trying to find a path where few have trodden, for narrow is the way that leads to the light. When our sea goat rises out of the clouds, storms, and fog to the summit, he finds himself standing in the brilliant light of the one whose effulgence is the effulgence of the sun. It is here that he finds himself transformed into a unicorn. His two horns representing duality become one, symbolizing his one-pointedness and penetrating spiritual vision, thus mounting the cardinal cross. Having attained enlightenment, Capricorn finds himself rather lonely at the top of the mountain, and must thus descend to help those still struggling upwards, in the guise of Aquarius, the world's servant, and then Pisces, the world's savior, to bring the light which he has discovered down to illuminate the rest of the world. In many initiatic traditions, a neophyte would be forced to crawl a long distance through some kind of tunnel, he was prevented from standing upright like a man, as he must first conquer his beastly nature. Capricorn is the sign which rules the knees, and it is on his knees that the neophyte must offer himself to spiritual service, and only on his knees can he pass through the door of initiation to be entrusted with the secrets of the cosmos. Every symbol of initiation corresponds to a particular inner experience, 
and Evola says that initiation in its highest forms was conceived as an intensely real operation that was capable of changing the ontological status of the individual, grafting onto him certain forces of the world of being or of the overworld. Initiation changes the aspirant by bringing him into contact with divine forces through ritual. It is magic in its most original meaning. How could one touched by the finger of God ever go back to the way he was? However, initiation does not mean consummation. Initiation is the starting of something, not the completion. And it lies entirely with the candidate to make his initiation valid and to seal up the link. Once the seed that was always within you has sprouted, it is up to you to water and tend it so that it may grow. Initiation causes the seed to sprout, to break free of the dark underground and grow towards the divine light. In his lecture entitled Journey of the Human Soul Through the Astrological Cycles, esotericist Manly P. Hall beautifully described the initiate thusly. Instead of attempting to conquer the world, he attempted to conquer worldliness in himself realizing he was bound here by the very ambitions which he sought to satisfy or to gratify. Consequently, by becoming desireless, by no longer responding to the allurements of the world, by no longer admitting the power of the world, he could perhaps escape from its tremendous insidious effect upon himself. Ancient man then really believed he had to be born again out of this world, if possible born without death, but instead of dying out of a material state, he must die out of the materiality in himself. This was the second birth. This was the twice-born one who had achieved conscious liberation during life. It was a birth into a new state into which the Greeks said the hero dwelled. The hero being the person who had overcome the world as an experience of consciousness was therefore free from it because it could no longer be stimulated in himself. He would no longer hate, he would no longer desire, he would no longer sacrifice his principles for his possessions. He gained a certain detachment. How did he do it? Usually by becoming internally conscious in some way of something superior to the world. He could not escape while he believed in the world, but if by mystical experience or by the strange disciplines of ancient esoteric sciences and philosophies, he was able to experience inwardly a freedom from this world and realized that in departing from it as an experience of consciousness, he was not leaving the greater for the lesser or the known for the unknown, but rather that he was leaving something that he had outgrown, leaving darkness for light leaving things that are not true for things that are, gaining more than he could possibly lose, finding himself by sacrificing that which was not his real self. Buddhism taught this in renunciation, that the individual through inward discipline gradually relaxed away from the world, and having done so, he passed through the first gate of the mysteries. As the march of time has dragged the world further and further away from the world of tradition, subsequent degeneration occurred. While initiation itself already indicates a deviation from the world of tradition, it did serve the function of endowing the king with the ancient regal dignity that he required in his role as pontifex. Over time, however, as decadence set in, that regal dignity began to be retained on a different plane than that of temporal royal power, which eventually fell into profane hands. Even in the ancient world, this rot had already set in. 
Evola remarks that temporal sovereigns still aspired to obtain the dignity of an initiatory king, which was very different from the dignity they actually enjoyed as profane political leaders. He gives the example of Hadrian and Antoninus, both of whom were already Roman emperors when they sought to receive the title of king after taking part in the Eleusinian Mysteries. What makes one a true and legitimate king is the state of being a superior man. Evola writes, In ancient China, a distinction was made between those who were naturally endowed with knowledge and virtue, those who are capable of fulfilling heaven's law with calm and imperturbability, and no help from the outside, are at the pinnacle and are perfected and transcendent men, and those who achieved them by disciplining themselves and returning to the rites. The discipline that is suitable to the latter men, and that is the equivalent of initiation, was considered only as a means to the real creation of that superior man, who could legitimately assume the function proper to the supreme hierarchical apex, by virtue of the mysterious and real power inherent in him. The distinction here is that of one who is born regal, one who comes from a divine lineage that traces its origins back to a god, and who is simply born with a regal ontological nature, versus one who, through disciplined ritual and initiation, can trace his way back to that primordial state, and acquire, reawaken, or reinvigorate the regal divinity within him. But what happens when the king is no longer born regal, and is unable to acquire it for himself through initiation. The solution to this was consecration. Consecration is an example of something that, at first glance, seems like a sign of high tradition, but actually represents yet another level of degradation. In this case, the king is no longer innately spiritual, and the priests no longer know how to chart a path to help him reclaim his spiritual nature. This indicates a degradation, not just of the kingship, but of the priesthood as well. In this case, the priestly caste claims spiritual authority for itself. The priests attract and mediate spiritual forces, but they are unable to manifest the law from above onto the earth. They don't possess it imminently. While they have contact with supernatural forces, they are unable to embody them in the way that the traditional king is meant to. They are unable to constitute a dominating center, as spinners of the wheel. Thus, the king must somehow be raised up to a regal level, so that he may embody the spiritual forces, and this is the purpose of consecration. The king is inducted into the priestly caste, regardless of what caste he has come from. Evola states that when a priestly caste or a church claims to be the exclusive holder of that sacred force that alone can empower the king to exercise his function, this marks the beginning of an involutive process, a spirituality that in and of itself is not regal, and conversely a regality that is not spiritual eventually emerged, and that the original synthesis which corresponded to the primordial regal attribute of glory or of the celestial fire of the conquerors was dissolved and the plane of absolute centrality was lost. Consecration was intended to reconstitute the synthesis between the regal and the priestly, in order that the king may again be something more than a mere mortal. However, it seems that there is a rather large gap between the results achieved by initiation versus the results achieved by investiture. Evola writes in the mask and face of contemporary spiritualism that generally whenever one is dealing with tradition, a figure is needed who acts as a stable and conscious bridge between the visible and the invisible, between the natural and the supernatural, between man and the divine. 
This is intended to guarantee the continuity and perennial nature of the transcendent contact with divine regality, which constitutes the axis of tradition, transmitting a presence and a vivifying and illuminating sacred force, a force without which every rite becomes mere ceremonial formalism. At each stage of the deterioration, the story of man is one where the higher way has become more and more obscured, the path overtaken by creepers and brush eventually disappearing into the dark forest again. The seedlings of divinity, straining to reach the light, are crowded out by a multitude of weeds that thrive in the darkness. The result of this deterioration, as we can easily witness today, is the complete inversion of truth in every aspect of what used to be called normal life. Initiation invoked the memory of the true path, imprinted as it is upon the spirit of every person in varying degrees. Initiation had a magical effect on the initiate, because it is like watering the metaphysical seeds deep inside the soul and psyche. It stirred something akin to mystical memory that belongs to a realm that we cannot fully grasp through discursive thought. There was a time in our prehistory before initiatory orders existed, when men were closer to the supernatural elements, when initiation was not required to bring the divine down to earth. Men of this era were beyond the need to initiate possessing an inherent and organic perception of the spiritual world, the dimensions that have become so deeply obscured to modern men, preoccupied as they are with material reality and the world of the senses. It is more important than ever for men to regain an initiatic character, to become kings unto themselves, that they might stand amidst the ruins of civilization and indeed do more than just stand, but tower above the morbidly confused masses, and perhaps, for some, offer a way forward. But with the path obscured and fallen into fallow, how then do we find the way? To initiate means to begin again, to become reborn, to give birth to a new life that entirely supplants and erases the old one, the individual starting over from the primordial forces as a symbolic victory and an allegory for the rebirth of the entire world. Everything is dissolving. There are no false supports. Do not look to others to liberate you. You must now turn inward. Each and every person must take it as their sacred duty to find the inner way forward. While we still have the echoes of the initiatic path and the wisdom of tradition to provide some guidance, for the most part, we must take stock of the desolation of our predicament and somehow find in it the starting point of a new beginning. Indeed, we can conclude that once one is no longer looking outwardly for signs or saviors, that only then does one truly begin to stir the deepest part of the soul. Only then does the real work commence. Flame by flame the energy converges. The light of the spirit that you kindle within yourself could be the beginning of your own emancipating fire, or could inspire unknown others to rise above modernity and become beacons for the world. When you set out on the path to fulfill your holy longing, the meaning and purpose of your life's journey begins to take shape. And even if the material world cannot be saved, we can win a sacred victory within our innermost places of wisdom and start again on a new life. Strive, seek your resonance with the divine, evoke the higher realms through your every thought and deed. In the words of Ernst Jünger, from the smallest genome to the loftiest vision, Man's totality is an unsurpassed vessel of potential.
For the city once full of riches Is now laid to rest She who ruled the peoples Sits in sadness There is none to console her now but one weeping sadly and tears were streaming down There is none to console her now But thou art God She is alone Without the world of sadness Bearing down Amongst the forests of endless return silent place where you find the gift of life it is in this silent place where you shall find the gift of life my king Across the tide of blood, the stream of his regeneration.